But to kick off, I am delighted to welcome in this very studio, MD Ravi Menon from the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Chairman Peter Ong from Enterprise Singapore, who will be sharing more about the format for this year and what we have planned. They'll be interviewed by Manisha Tank from Money FM. So I'll hand straight over to you, Manisha. Thank you for joining us today. Becca, Pat, thanks so much for that. And wonderful to see you both, Ravi, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Manisha. I have to say my heart was pumping when I saw the video. I'm really excited <laughs> about this big unveil that we're doing today. And we're going to talk later about what you can expect uh, in terms of everything happening later this year. But first of all, how have you both been? There are some people who just want a refund on 2020. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm having a really good time. It's uh, quite a bad thing to say, actually, given what's uh, going on in the rest of the world. But personally, it's been great working from home. Um, it's been uh, wonderful. Uh, and uh, it's a very different kind of life, something I'd never expected. It really is. It's making us all think about things slightly differently, isn't it? Peter, you were saying your children are grown up enough to not be the ones creeping into the shot when you're <laughs> doing right. from home. <laughs> well, it's work, for home, work from home for me too. And zero travel. So that's a blessing. Yeah, certainly. Now, look, one of the things we're going to discuss this morning, uh, today, is uh, people and talent. It's going to be a big theme that we're going to touch on. But before we get there, I want to ask you both uh, a little bit about what you were like when you were young boys. Ravi, when you were younger, what did you aspire to be? Well, um, I had always wanted to be a writer. Um, and uh, when I was young, well, I still am, but when I was younger, um, <laughs> I used to read very widely, uh, all kinds of books. Uh, 1984, George Orwell was a favorite. Oh, wow. And I was thrilled by the way he uses his works. Uh, the Tower of Physics, uh, Fridja Kapra, City of Joy, Dominic Lapierre, uh, Free to Choose, Milton Friedman. That's when I got derailed from writing to become an economist. Uh, autobiography of a Yogi, Paramahansa Yogananda. Um, I was really thrilled at how words are used to evoke um, emotions, provoke thinking, um, and how the arrangement is such an original creation of the person writing it. Um, so I've always enjoyed doing that. And I wrote short stories and poems. Um, but as you can see, I didn't quite achieve my childhood ambition. Well, you've achieved plenty of other things. Oh, well. <laughs> then there was me thinking at the age of three, I wanted to be the MD of MAS. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what about you? Well, I have to go back to high school. Um, I was on the school debating team and we did win the national uh, competition of course so i thought i could be on the winning side of an argument <laughs> and so i thought maybe I'll, I'll study law and maybe be, become a litigator and then at the right old age of 19 i showed up before the public service commission now the public service commission in singapore is the entity that awards scholarships to graduating high school students so the chairman interviewed me and he said what do you want to do and i said maybe i'd like to be a lawyer he said, I tell you what, you go study economics. And well, my life circumstances then were such that in order to have an overseas education, I, I, I had to take up the scholarship. And um, I went off to study economics, came back, joined the public service, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> yeah, and here you are now. And the point of having this conversation is because this is a big theme. We're talking about people and we're talking about talent. Uh, I want to bring that up with you, first of all, Ravi, because the idea is to honor talent development and also focus on individuals. I know that's been a big focus for you. Yeah. Well, each year, we, like I said, we do have a, a, a theme for the festival and uh, an SFF switch. Mm -hmm. And this year is people and talent. Um, and I thought it was most appropriate because 2020 is going to go down in history as the year of the pandemic and uh, the human cost is tragic, the economic cost is widespread. Um, but I think the story would not be complete uh, if we also did not tell the story of the people, uh, people who exhibited great courage, resilience, and creativity uh, in the face of adversity, who found solutions to how uh, life can carry on, how societies can continue to function. Um, I thought that was quite inspiring. and. Um, and innovation and creativity played a big part in all of this, um, alongside courage and resilience, of course. And the SFF switch is really a celebration of that. It's a celebration of innovation. It's a celebration of creativity. And we wanted to focus on that. 
So we will showcase the uh, trailblazers who uh, made a big difference, who changed things uh, in the world of technology and finance, uh, the uh, rising new stars who could potentially change the world of tomorrow in a post-pandemic post world, um, and also honor uh, everyone else, part of the ecosystem who, who made this work. So we're going to focus also, and human and people and talent, I think, are also going to be critical in addressing five challenges that uh, we want the FinTech Festival to address. Um, and we've structured the festival around these five, five global challenges. Um, so each day we will have a summit dedicated to one of these challenges. It's a five day long uh, event. And on the first day, the festival will focus on uh, responding to the pandemic and emerging from the pandemic. Um, so that will be your uh, pandemic summit, if you will. And then we'll talk about creating the digital infrastructure of the future, um, which would be at the infrastructure summit. And then the um, third item would be to enhance sustainability and inclusion, which we will have under the impact summit. Um, and it's also critical to restore investors' confidence in the future. Yeah. We need to invest for the future. And uh, Investor Summit does that. And last, to build skills for the future. The future is going to be very different. Uh, we need very different skill sets to do that. And the uh, Talent Summit addresses a key issue in the tech, tech area, which is about building skills uh, so that we're digitally ready for a digital future. Yep. We're all having to go through this as well. And I think for the first time in a long time, we find ourselves all on the same page in a way. Uh, the same screen, if you will. <laughs> the same, absolutely. Peter, let me take it to you because I, you know, I want to see the perspective from the side of Switch. Uh, you've got to address a new normal here. How do you do that? Well, even last year, pre-COVID, uh, people and talent was uppermost on our minds because the kind of ecosystem that we were going to develop, tech ecosystem, uh, needs to take into account that Singapore only has a small population, five and a half million people. So this ecosystem is not going to be one with an abundance of scientists, engineers and coders. Uh, it has to be a compact but well connected to the external environment and a highly collaborative uh, ecosystem. And But now, uh, this year, fast forward this year, with COVID, this this theme of people and talent takes on special significance for at least two reasons. One is that amidst the dismal outlook, um, there are still bright spots in terms of job opportunities in the digital and tech uh, sector. And secondly, this is an excellent opportunity uh, for us to profile the uh, results of innovation of working in the new normal. And therefore, uh, Switch uh, takes on uh, special significance and we want Switch to be the platform to profile the, the issues of people and talent and also how we can operate in the new normal. So Switch will be organized along three tracks with two uh, signature events. But on the three tracks, the first one is, as I said, on people, it's the community track. And then we will profile Asian founders and business leaders. We will profile women in tech and celebrate the resilience and the grit uh, that comes uh, with adversity that they've gone through. The second track is the sector track. And by sector, I mean the uh, industry sectors which uh, mirror the key uh, sectors in our economy where there's greatest development potential. And what are they? Health and uh, biomed, biomed and health sciences, urban solutions and uh, digital economy, uh, trade and connectivity, uh, agri-food technology. And um, so there are some of these uh, sectors that we will profile over many conferences. And the third uh, track that we're going to do is really a track on technology. And here we're talking about cross-cutting technology that applies across all different industries like uh, robotics, AI, blockchain, 5G, quantum computing. Besides these three tracks, we will have two uh, signature events. One is uh, what we call Slingshot. Slingshot is a global startup competition. Our fourth edition will be done this year. Last year, we had about 2,400 startups competing. And this year, um, 
the end uh, application is still open till September. Uh, we have close to about 2,000 uh, uh, applicants, and I will expect in the last few weeks, many more will come through. And Slingshot will have two new features this year. One is uh, a separate stream to create competition along operating in a new normal. And the second stream really has to do with the corporate innovation platform, where we invite corporates to interact with the startups, and they will have an opportunity to interact with the top 500 startups from our Slingshot competition. The second event is tech innovation, which is really technolo technology to industry uh, matching, where we, through open innovation, try to match the seekers of technology and the producers of technology. You know, I have to ask, I'm curious, was there ever a point earlier this year where you thought, wait a second, how are we going to do this? Because, you know, it's all very hands-on with Switch, and, I, and I'm sure there's you know, the festival has become so famous and it's been very popular with these young startups, right? Uh, some of them may are thinking, how on earth would I get involved with this? Was there ever, ever a point where you were a bit worried, like, how are we going to manage this? Well, I think uh, COVID really gave us an opportunity to redefine how we would do uh, the event. I mean, last year we had, uh, as Ravi said earlier, uh, 60,000 um, uh, participants. We had 1,000 combined um, the FinTech Festival and Switch, a thousand exhibitors. We had about uh, 570 speakers, uh, 50 in innovation lab crawls. Uh, we obviously cannot uh, have such a big congregation of people here in Singapore. So it gave us a chance to redefine. And I think what we're hoping to do this year is a combination of both uh, the physical and the virtual. On that note, there will be people listening right now who are thinking, okay, this is great, but how on earth are you going to pull this off? Ravi, it falls to you to explain how is this festival going to work this year? Right. So as, as Peter said, we, um, the great thing about the FinTech Festival is it's a platform for connectivity. It's a platform for networking and collaboration. It's not an event. So we started scratching our heads. How are we going to recreate that, right? It's very easy to go digital. Um, and so we came up with this idea of a hybrid event, which combines both digital and physical experiences. Uh, physical experiences, we've said, if we can't congregate 60,000 people in one place, can we congregate 60,000 people in different places around the world? And so we started exploring a network of partnerships with other cities. And then to overlay a digital experience, because what brings it together is a digital platform. And so to create what we call an online city, uh, which all these physical cities will be connected to, and they get to hear uh, speakers, they get to participate in panel discussions, they get to uh, look at the exhibits of people from you know, thousands of miles away on, a, on what we call the online city, which is really a digital platform, uh, 24, 7, 24 hours over five days. Um, and we're even thinking of having discussions uh, across time zones uh, stitched up uh, so that people, if you want to really stay up the whole day, you could, the, the festival will last right through the day. Well, I'm sure the content will be good enough that that will be happening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the content will be, uh, we've got very good, uh, very promising uh, responses from all those we spoke to. So it's an exciting idea. It's a first of its kind, um, continuous round the clock combining both digital and physical experiences. Well, it sounds really exciting. Peter, I'm wondering from your perspective, I, I always sensed that Switch was very hands-on. So how do you get past that? Well, uh, we told ourselves that people really want to attend this or participate in this because they want to meet people. And so we felt that uh, one way to do this, uh, building on the platform idea was to also power the platform through AI. And that allows anyone who's put in his uh, profile to be able to know who they can meet. It's really hands-on, as you say. And tying up different partners uh, on the part of Switch, we are going to leverage on the 35 offices that Enterprise Singapore has all around the world and the 13 Global Innovation Alliance partners in 13 different cities, in, in 13 different innovation nodes around the world to have physical events. And, and, but they are all live streamed onto the virtual platform. So for example, if you're a participant from Latin America, and there is a physical event going on in Zhongguan Chun in Beijing, which is the Silicon Valley of China, uh, you will be able to participate from the comfort of your home or office in Latin America, the actual event going on in Zhongguan Chun, and connect with people. 
so it's going to be very hands-on uh, across time zones. So what we're hoping to achieve is a very global feel, uh, a very engaging feel, but an easy one, so that everyone can feel they can participate. Oh, so you can really evoke some local, sort of local connectivity with all of these partners. And I guess that applies for both aspects of the festival, right? Yes, yes. So the beauty of having these distributed physical uh, events yep. uh, in various cities is that each of those events would have a local flavor uh, that would be particularly appealing to the people of that country or region. Um, at the same time, through the digital platform, there is global connectivity. Um, actually, if you, when we think about it again, we were wondering, why do we have to wait till COVID to think of something like this? <laughs> <laughs> but this is true. So I'm just wondering whether this could be a model that we use again in the future in different ways. But just to clarify and to get a real handle on how this is going to work, let's say, you know, I'm in Germany, for example, and I want to be a part of this. It's, Peter, you were kind of explaining the similar thing that you can check in almost with an event that's going on halfway around the world. And I like this point that you're making, Ravi, that actually, why did we have to wait for adversity before we could, we could do this? Mm -hmm. How are you both feeling about this? It sounds pretty exciting to me, Ravi. Well, it is. And uh, this would be a grand experiment, actually, yeah. on a global scale um, to see how this works. Uh, digital platforms are not new, uh, and we could talk about it later. There are lots of digital platforms that you get, get onto and help to connect to people you've never seen or heard of uh, at all. And that's what brings the world closer together. And here we'll have a live demonstration of that. Uh, a big part of the FinTech Festival was the exhibitions where, where the, uh, especially entrepreneurs and startups, for them, they don't have big advertising money or marketing campaigns. And so they need to demonstrate their solutions and the people coming through the booths are the main way of doing it. Um, so in this way, actually they can theoretically reach out to a much larger audience because if there are going to be 60,000 or we hope 100,000 people uh, connected to the platform, uh, checking in, that's a wonderful way to sell you what you have, sell your solutions. And there are also people looking for solutions who would go onto these platforms and advertise and ask, do you have a solution for this problem? So I think there's a great way to bring people together, uh, bring problems and solutions together, um, and also for people to have one-on-one -on -one discussions. So we'll make provisions for that in the platform so that they can carry on their networking uh, offline. On it sounds like a colossal enterprise, but Peter, I mean, perhaps it's the wrong metaphor, but it almost feels like fintech startup dating is possible. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, def definitely. I'm, I'm very excited. Um, but I think we will also be learning a lot because uh, as we provide the platform and offer the menu of both physical and virtual activities, uh, people will behave and through their sort of mass behaviors, uh, we can learn what people like to do and, you know, and then uh, make it even easier for them to do whatever it is they like to do, which we sitting here cannot even imagine. So I think it will be a, 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 peer, a journey of discovery for all of us. And, and we look forward to working very closely with our partners to discover what is it that will maximize the experience for our participants. That's actually a very interesting idea that you've picked up on. And you, you alluded to this before that actually this whole experience with COVID-19 has opened up some opportunities. I'm sure you found that very much to be the case. Absolutely. Um, digitalization, that's a big word, but it's really been uh, one of the biggest beneficiaries uh, from COVID. We've been giving speeches, we've been giving a lot of government support schemes to encourage companies to digitalize. Well, COVID just was the largest unplanned impetus for digitalization. For example, uh, we started a scheme called Grow Digital. This was before COVID um, in November last year, basically to help uh, small companies, uh, first time, uh, wanting to sell overseas through B2B or B2C platform. And they could do it uh, without the need to do a lot of these ancillary services like payments or last mile fulfillment because an intermediary would do it for them. And when COVID struck, we had 1,400 of our companies sign on in, in very short time because they knew that they had to ramp up very quickly and adapt and adjust and uh, diversify into markets which hopefully were still open at that time. And uh, that, that was something which we learned and that was something the uh, enterprises themselves learned. And uh, that, that was a great journey. And I look forward to many more such discoveries because you never know 
uh, where new innovations can come from. I'll give you another example. Uh, Strato, uh, they do uh, dental devices through D 3D printing. Uh, but because of uh, circuit break, breaker and lockdown, no dental services could be provided. And immediately they pivoted uh, using 3D printing to make medical devices. So face shields, uh, swaps, um, they were able to use that, that same technology and platform and now they are, they are able to meet very fast growing demand in that sector. Yeah, it's been incredible how many companies have managed to do that, to pivot from one thing to another in a way that it can help with that, that fight, if you like, with COVID. Uh, on that note, Ravi, one of the things that in our day to day, not just here in Singapore, but all over the world, and this is a small example, is uh, cashless payments making it easy for no contact. That's just one small innovation that has just had to rapidly transition in a lot of places. But so far as banking goes, we're seeing it right across the spectrum, aren't we? This resilience. Exactly. And um, financial services in particular has been doing pretty well uh, because um, it was able to function uh, and carry on because most of its functions were digital. And uh, I think if you, and it runs a full gamut of the things that financial institutions do. Um, so electronic payments, which is already becoming very popular, has taken off spectacularly uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, one can't just imagine if we did not have electronic payments, if we did not have online delivery services, uh, how would we have gotten through this? Um, so it's amazing that the infrastructure that was put in place uh, has served us so well. And uh, it's not just e-payments, it's also online banking because you don't want to go to the branch, but you need to carry out the transactions. A lot more people have gone on to digital banking. You can now open a bank account in Singapore in just a few minutes without stepping into a branch from the comfort of your home uh, with few, full due diligence done uh, because of uh, my info where you can actually authorize the bank to have access to your data, which is verifiable, uh, sitting on government data sources, uh, but you hold the key and they can do a verification and open an account. You can also do an account opening through facial recognition um, and other biometrics. So I think these changes are in some ways irreversible. I don't think many of us are gonna go back to using check, writing checks or walking into a bank branch to, to carry out any transactions because most of that can be done online now. But I think beyond that, um, we are seeing bigger changes in how uh, the financial services industry is operating. Um, I think especially with uh, 5G technology coming on board, uh, it's going to completely transform financial services. It's already been transformed by digital technologies, but this is going to make it even bigger. Um, this will make augmented reality a reality uh, where you can have a lot more interactive uh, banking services. Yep. Uh, because today the choice is either you want to talk to a live person across a, a, brand, a teller, a counter, or you go onto a screen and it's very impersonal. Uh, we're looking at a world where actually you can combine the two and actually talk to a live person, but it doesn't have to be uh, on, 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 uh, in a physical premise. And you get the comfort as well as the convenience of being able to connect with people who can offer you financial advice uh, not limited to your geographical region. And I think that those kinds of changes are coming where banks will be able to provide services anywhere to anyone, anytime. So that more of that hybrid reality that we've already yes. been talking about. Um, Ravi, just however, on that subject, you, you spoke about data just a short while ago. Um, are there any issues here for regulators? What sort of things are regulators having to focus on? Yeah, so here is the um, dilemma with data. Um, Aggregating data, uh, sharing data, um, and uh, analyzing that data yields tremendous insights, which you can then use for the greater good of society uh, to serve uh, individuals' customized needs um, and, and draw insights that can inform policy, that can inform strategy, and so on. Uh, product design, for instance. Um, at the same time, data is a lot of data is personal, um, and there are very legitimate concerns about uh, privacy and confidentiality. There are also concerns about security, meaning I don't mind my data being used by party A for purpose B, but how do I know that 
it's not being used by somebody else or it's yeah. not being hacked. So I think this is the great dilemma we're facing in data. Uh, the answer does not lie in data localization or non-sharing or building firewalls around it, uh, nor does it lie in making it so widely available that people you know, don't feel uh, comfortable or confident that they are being well served and there's room for exploitation. Um, so we want to avoid data monopolization. We want to avoid data segmentation. I think we, the, one of the central challenges for governments anywhere in the world is to find that balance for achieving good data governance. It's a subject that I think uh, not many people have started to think about. In Europe, I think they have. Uh, and here in Singapore, we pay a lot of attention to it. That if you don't get this right, if people don't have the confidence uh, that the data is well protected and used for the purposes for which uh, uh, it is perpetrated to be used, uh, they're going to lose confidence. And you lose a social license for using data in a socially uh, redemptive way, which I think data has a lot of potential to do. Uh, on the subject of data, I should also add the other dimension that's missing, and we are working quite hard at it, is data connectivity across countries. Yep. Data needs to not just flow from one place to another. It needs to flow across borders because global businesses are global, uh, are, are operating across borders. Uh, global financial institutions, for instance, um, if we wanted to detect uh, potential fraud or money laundering, you need to pull data from your, all the markets that you're operating in and analyze that and discover patterns that you would not be able to discern if you're only looking at isolated chunks. Uh, same applies for risk management. What are your exposures like? What are your market risks like? Uh, all this requires data to be consolidated. Yep. Yep. And that means we need protocols, connectivity agreements, as we do in trade for goods uh, and services, for data, for data to flow between two countries. What are the protocols that ensure security, privacy, uh, and speed and efficiency. On that kind of thing, I'm sure, Peter, that comes up a lot when you're talking to startups or you're, you're thinking about all these cross-border connections, right? Most definitely. I mean, uh, just as financial institutions need um, volumes and volumes of data, uh, enterprises uh, require data uh, to understand their markets, their customer segmentation. Uh, deep tech uh, uh, companies, uh, those that do very uh, advanced uh, scientific uh, R&D, uh, need to do a lot of randomized trials. So they need to collect lots and lots of data and use them in an intelligent way. So it goes back to the point about uh, people and talent again, getting the right people and talent to make sense of the data, data, data scientists, uh, data analysts. I think that that's, uh, that's going to be a, a major investment that uh, Singapore definitely would uh, be uh, putting a lot of resources into. Well, Peter, you very gracefully brought us full circle there because we just have a couple of minutes left before I hand back to Becca and Pat. And before we do, I want to get your elevator pitch, but I promise you it can be more than 30 seconds <laughs> uh, for getting people to come and join in later this year for the festival. Peter, you first. Well, um, this is a global platform where everyone can come on board and uh, contribute your ideas and network. Um, and this is um, a combination of both physical and virtual activities uh, for you to do from the comfort of your home or your office to connect and to interact and transact. So we hope to see you there as we profile people and talent for Asia out of Singapore. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can even do it in your pyjamas, can't you, <laughs> Ravi? Well, um, I've always believed FinTech was about innovation uh, inclusion and inspiration. And this year's event, uh, the way we are conceiving it, uh, hits all, all three buttons very strongly. Um, it is, of course, innovative. It could, as you said earlier on, change the way events like this uh, are organized in future. Uh, it's a grand experiment. Uh, it is inclusive because more than any other event now, we are able to draw in and include in this platform people from all over the world uh, thousands of miles apart who would not otherwise have, have joined this, this uh, enterprise. And it's inspiring because I think by bringing innovators together um, and getting the creative juices flowing and exchanging ideas uh, and networking and investing for the future, we can create a better world and emerge stronger from this crisis. So we know it's going to be online, it's going to be live, 
Uh, remind us when, remind us how many days. Right, it's from the 7th of December to the 11th of December, over five days. Uh, because this is an exceptional event, we've shifted from the usual November window. Next year, we'll be back in November, but for this year, mark the date, 7 to 11 December 2020. That's great. Well, we're all very excited. Thank you both Thank for, you. for that and running us through everything that we can expect later this year. Ravi Menon, MD at MAS, Monetary Authority of Singapore, and Chairman of Enterprise Singapore, Peter Ong. Thank you both so much.